Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. In this not really a lecture, we're going to solve a series of problems. First you're going to solve them and then I'm going to demonstrate ways to think through them. These are simple problems, no crossovers, only male meiosis, so we have all four gametes to all four products of meiosis to consider. We'll consider one and two genes, homozygous or heterozygous, on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes. And we'll consider whether we're thinking about the products of one meiosis or the pool of products of many meiosis. Now, this is a rather long lecture compared to the others, but you don't have to deal with it all at once. You can Watch one problem, figure out one problem, and then go away. Come back later and try another problem. So here's the first problem. A man has genotype A1, A2. We're only considering one gene on one chromosome. What gametes is meiosis going to produce? So by far the easiest way to solve problems like this is to simulate them with chromosomes made of paper strips as we did in the first video of module 6 for mitosis. So let's do that now for meiosis. So this man has genotype A1, A2 and I've shown that as two long chromosomes, a pink one and a yellow one with the two alleles on them. I've also included homologs of a medium-sized chromosome and of a short chromosome. But because we don't know anything about the genes on these other chromosomes, there's no need to pay attention to them. They're not going to influence what happens with this chromosome. So we can simply remove them from the picture. Now the first thing that's going to happen is that our chromosomes are going to replicate their DNA. So here's the sister chromatids just as in mitosis, the sister chromatids stay together, paired along their length, held together by loops of cohesin protein. But unlike mitosis, the next step isn't attachment of the spindles, but instead these homologs have to find each other and pair up. And we'll discuss in the next video how it is that they manage to pair up accurately, why they never pair up wrong way around like that. They always pair up like this. Once they've paired up, each has a single kinetochore. Each pair of sisters has a single kinetochore and spindle fibers can attach from both sides. As in mitosis, the spindle fibers don't attach tightly unless there's a they're pulling their pulling power is being opposed by pulling from the other side. Once that happens, this tug of war moves the paired homologs, each consisting of two sisters, to the middle of the cell. And once all of the chromosomes in the cell have found their partners, found their spindle fiber, found spindle fibers of some sort, and been moved to the center of the cell, then the signal is generated that allows the homologs to separate. And separation of the homologs is just like separation of sister chromatids in mitosis. Each homolog consisting of two sisters is pulled to the poles of the cell, and the cell divides. That's the end of meiosis one. Meiosis two, as we said, is just like mitosis. The two sister chromatids are held together by loops of cohesin. They're attached by spindle fibers, moved to the center of the cell. Usually, the two um, daughter cells from meiosis one are moving more or less in synchrony, and once all of the chromosomes in the cell are aligned, more or less, have moved to the center of the cell with spindle fibers attached to both sides, then the signal comes, the cohesin is cut by separase, and the sister chromatids come apart. And the cell divides, cells, both cells divide this way, generating the four products of meiosis. Two gametes with genotype A1, two gametes with genotype A2. In our second problem, we're considering a different man. This man is homozygous for the A1 allele of gene A, but he's heterozygous for a different gene, gene G. And this gene is on a different chromosome. 
What kind of gametes will a single meiosis of this man produce? Now, this problem seems more complicated because we're told about two different genes on two different chromosomes. And so I've set up the problem again with the paper strips. Um, two long chromosomes with A1 alleles of gene A and two shorter chromosomes with G1 and G2 alleles of gene G. Now, we simulate meiosis exactly the same as before replicating the DNA with the sister chromatids staying together. And then the homologs find each other. The A chromosome, the long chromosome, finds its homolog, and the short chromosome finds its homolog. And then spindle fibers attach and move the paired homologs, each consisting of two sisters, to the center of the cell. And once all the chromosomes have done the same, then the cell divides and the spindle fibers pull the pairs of sisters, one of each pair of homologs, to the two poles of the cell. Now, and then the next step, cell divides. Next step is meiosis two, and just like mitosis, the paired sisters are attached to spindle fibers and move to the center of the cell. And the cell divides. The, a single sister chromatid from each homolog is moved to the poles of the cell. The cells divide again. And we have our four gametes, two with genotype A1G1, two with genotype A2G2. Now, many of you are probably saying, wait a minute, you made it more complicated than it needed to be. And they're absolutely right. The, because the man in question was homozygous for gene A, we didn't really need to follow gene A at all in this problem. We knew from the start that all the gametes were going to have the A1 allele because that's the only allele the man had. He had two copies of A1. And so we could have completely removed these chromosomes from consideration because they're homozygous. We know what the outcome is going to be. OK, here's our third problem. Again, we've got two genes to think about. But this time, instead of the genes being on different chromosomes, the genes are on the same chromosome, so close that we don't need to think about crossovers at all. And again, you're to predict what gametes will a single meiosis produce. Now, this problem, well, it might be more complicated. It might be more simple. The A and B genes are on the same chromosome, so that means we only need to consider one chromosome. But there's two genes on the chromosome, so maybe that makes it more complicated. We're told we don't need to worry about crossovers, that they're very rare. So let's just do it and see what we get. Here's our two chromosomes. I've drawn A1 and B2 close together to remind us that we don't need to worry about crossovers. And as usual, it's always the same. The DNA replicates. The homologs find each other. They move to the center of the cell. And they're pulled apart. And then the two products of meiosis 1. Again, the chromosomes, the sister chromatids, are attached by spindle fibers, and they're pulled apart. Two cells are B1A1. Two cells are B2A1. And again, we didn't need to worry about the A alleles at all because the man was homozygous for A. We could have just written B1 on our, and B2 on our chromosomes and completely ignored the A alleles. In the next problem, things finally get a little more interesting. We were still considering two genes, but this time the man is heterozygous for both genes, gene A and gene G. They're on different chromosomes, so what gametes is a single meiosis going to produce?
Now that might not have been the answer that you expected. So let's do this problem. It's a bit more complicated and of course more interesting because this man is heterozygous for two different genes. He's got two different versions of the A allele on the big chromosome and he's got two different versions of the G allele on a separate chromosome. So here we go. It's just It's a no-brainer. We just replicate the chromosomes. chromosomes. They find their homologous partners. A1 and A2 pair up. G1 and G2. Oh, no, not that way. This way. G1 and G2 pair up. Spindle fibers pull them to the center of the cell. And when everybody's ready, the homologs are pulled apart. So that's meiosis 1. Now meiosis 2, again, we're following two chromosomes, but it's exactly the same. The sister chromatids are still held together by cohesin. Spindle fibers move them to the center of each of the two products of meiosis 1. And then when everybody's ready, cohesin is cut and the sister chromatids come apart. And the result is two cells that are G2A2 and two cells that are G1A1. But that wasn't the right answer. How come? Well, let's back up. So we're going to run meiosis in reverse. Pair the sisters back up. Bring the homologs back together. Line them up on the uh, so-called metaphase plate. And pull them apart. Did you notice what was different this time? Last time, we had a long pink chromosome with a short yellow chromosome. They went like this. This time, they went like this. Each of those outcomes is equally likely because the spindle fibers don't know which genotype of chromosome they're attaching to. They just attach and pull. They don't know which homolog it is. And so half of the time, it's going to turn out this way because the spindle fibers from the same pole attach to both pink chromosomes. And half the time, it's going to be this way because the spindle fibers from this pole attach to one pink chromosome and one yellow chromosome. And that's why we cannot predict the outcome of this particular meiosis unless we have additional information. And that information being which way did the spindle fibers attach to the homologs when in meiosis 1. Now, this problem is the same as the previous one, with one difference. Previously, we were thinking about a single meiosis. Now we're thinking about many meioses. And the situation was the same as before, but the answer is different. Now we know what the outcome is going to be. We're going to get a quarter of each of four different genotypes. And the reason is that because we have many meioses, we can be confident that about half of the time a meiosis is going to produce two gametes with genotype A1, G1, and two gametes with genotype A2, G2. And the other half of the time, it's going to produce gametes 2A1G2 and 2A2G1. Now, I'm not going to bother demonstrating this. It's basically the demonstration that I did previously multiplied 100 million times. A different genotype, again, this is a man who is heterozygous at two different loci, um, but these loci are on the same chromosome, not different chromosomes, but they're so close that we don't need to worry about crossing over. What gametes is one meiosis going to produce this time?
So this problem looks very similar to problem four in that our man is heterozygous for two genes. He's got two different alleles at each of two genes. The difference is that both of these genes are on the same chromosome and they're close enough that we don't have to worry about crossing over, which is good because we haven't learned about crossing over yet. So here's our chromosomes. We can make them go through meiosis. Here's your other sister. The DNA has replicated. The homologs find each other. They line up at the center of the cell. They're pulled apart. Two daughter products of meiosis one. Um, the sister chromatids are attached by spindle fibers and pulled apart. The cell divides again. We have four products of meiosis. Two B1A2, two B2A1. But that wasn't the right answer. The answer was we need more information. But there's only one way these chromosomes, it wouldn't matter if, I mean, it's true they could line up this way or they could line up this way, but the outcome's going to be the same. We're going to have two B2A1 gametes and two B1A2 gametes. What's the additional information that we need? Well, I misled you in when I drew these chromosomes. I kind of led you to believe that this was really the only way they could be drawn. I didn't raise the possibility that what if instead of having B1 and A2 on one homologue and B2A1 on the other, what if instead B1 and A1 were on the same chromosome and B2 and A2 were on the same chromosome? Nothing in the question lets us distinguish between this possibility and this possibility. And that's the information that we need in order to predict the outcome of this meiosis. It, and the answer would be exactly the same, although when we were considering two different chromosomes and they could line up two different ways, as long as we were looking at many meioses, it didn't matter. They would average out. We'd have 50% each way. But in this case, it doesn't matter how many meioses happen, Unless we know which combination we're dealing with, this combination or this combination, we can't predict the outcome. So here's our last problem. It's the same man, same genotype, but we have more information. This time we know who he inherited which allele from. So try the problem again. So our man is still heterozygous for A1, A2, and B1, B2. This might well be the same man we talked about in the last problem, but we have one more piece of information. We know that he inherited the A1 and B1 alleles from his father and the A2 and B2 alleles from his mother. That tells us that A1 and B1 must be on one homolog and A2, B2 on the other homolog. So now we can do the meiosis, the D cells, the DNAs replicate, the homologs pair, the cell pulls them apart, the cell divides, they separate again, the cell divides, we have two A1B1 gametes and two A2B2 gametes. And we'll get the same outcome no matter how many meioses we do because there are no crossovers between these genes. So we've done a bunch of genetics problems. We've considered a number of different situations. And my goal for this is that you've come out of it with a much clearer understanding of how the physical events of meiosis give rise to the genetic consequences for the gametes. Coming up next is probably my favorite part, certainly of module seven, which is a discussion of how the homologous chromosomes find each other in this pairing and how they manage to pair so perfectly that when they cross over, not a single base is lost or added. I hope to see you there.